Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillahi amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Imam Chris Karras, the Religious Director of the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh. And I'm at the ICP right now. We're in our conference room. We're just starting a new series, insha'Allah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the strength to keep up with it. About um, stories of people that have converted to Islam, returned to Islam, and picked up the deen, alhamdulillah, you know, from wherever they come from. As, um, you know, many masajid across the country are experiencing a huge surge in convert converts to Islam. And um, that's because, as, as I was just talking to a brother here, our guest, who I'll um, uh, introduce you to in just a moment, that um, a lot of Americans consider themselves religious free agents, so to speak. And that's a term that I heard recently from one of them who visited the uh, ICP to ask a few questions about Islam. And um, for that reason, and um, among others, wanted to have this series of interviews, hopefully, you know, every month at the, at the, at the very least, interview a new um, you know, one of the converts of the community, whether they are someone who just recently converted to the religion of Islam, or they have, um, you know, or if they converted 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, and they can share their experiences, their wisdom, their observations, and maybe give advice for uh, people uh, that might be curious to learn about um, what it might be like to make that change in their lives, inshallah ta'ala. So without further ado, I have with me Brother Saeed Abdul Latif, who formerly was known by as known as Father Hilarion Hiaji. Did I pronounce that right? Hagi. Yeah. Hagi. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hagi. And um, Let's yeah. Hagi. All right. All right. And uh, I I know some folks refer to you sometimes as Haji. Have, have you heard that one before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and inshallah ta'ala, yeah, Allah will give you the. Uh, the ability and tawfiq to make the hajj. And so, um, and uh, so, Brother Saeed here, he has, he accepted Islam formerly, or formerly with us on, it was Yom Tarwiyah, the 8th of the Hijjah, just in the lobby of the ICP, just the day before the day of Arafah last year in 2022, which would have been I think like July 6th or 7th or something like that. And then, um, Alhamdulillah. And, that, and then earlier this year, you... Uh, in November of last year. Okay, okay. Yeah, that was when the news broke? Oh yeah, the news broke at the end of February. Okay, that's right, right before Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. And, um, now, originally, Brother Saeed, he reached out to me, uh, Father Hilarion, during Ramadan a year previously in uh, 2022. And, um, you know, as soon as I got this email from Hilarion Hayag, or Hagi, sorry, um, I, you know, it was, uh, just a habit, I Googled his name and saw a lot of info about him, so I realized that. Um, you know, this is going to be, um, you know, quite a, um, a big thing that here's a, um, a very well-known Byzantine Catholic priest that is considering Islam and, and asking about Islam and how he feels like he's a Muslim in a priest garb. And so, you know, one thing, and, and then shortly after that, you actually started your blog under the pseudonym of Brendan Green. Mm -hmm. Now, you talk in your blog about your journey, and a lot of folks have, have read that, and I think you mentioned that it's been translated into many different languages yep. organically. You didn't know, did anyone no. contact you and say, oh, can I translate your blog to no. Bangladeshi or something like that? <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, I, the blog was meant to be, uh, like you said, it was written under a pseudonym, um, partly because I wasn't finished with it, it was a sort of work in progress, and I meant it to be uh, something for my personal friends and family, uh, so solely, not, not like a public blog, so so if 
if they asked me about my conversion to Islam, I would have, I would just point to this blog and I wouldn't have to repeat things over <laughs> or it would explain things better. Uh, but, uh, but then sort of news got out and someone found the blog and then it was disseminated pretty wild, widely. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when the news got out, that was, that was the Facebook post where you made the Shahada. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know how, I felt that, so I was living uh, for, I was living briefly in a monastery in California, um, and I still keep in contact with the abbot and the monks there, they're just wonderful men, um, but it was during that time in California where um, my conversion to Islam was a 22 or some year process, because uh, I first discovered, I first discovered Islam Islam and started studying it in, you know, shortly after 9-11 uh, actually I was going to University of Pittsburgh here in Pittsburgh um, and sort of brought Islam to the forefront for a lot of Americans actually and uh, you know at the time like a lot of Americans I didn't know what really Islam was so I started studying it and uh, the more I studied it uh, the more I was attracted to it uh, Nearly converted in 2003, but for a number of reasons I felt I couldn't. <laughs> Either my family, you know, our society, or you know, it was just a, something that I just couldn't. I felt I couldn't make that jump yet. Um, but it was always sort of on the back burner for me, and it wasn't until um, I was working on my master's in theology at Marquette University in Milwaukee from 2019 till 2022 um, that I really started to feel especially attracted to Islam and started reading about it more, uh, you know, the theology and the spiritual life and the prayer life. Um, and yeah, that all sort of cul uh, culminated in uh, 2022 in California. And uh, I just felt at some point that my understanding of Islam and where I was spiritually, I had, that's sort of what I believed. <laughs> but it was a very gradual process, I think. Mm -hmm. so, um, and so at that point, it was just a matter of what to do about it. And uh, I took a leave of absence, basically. Um, asked to come back to Pittsburgh, where I'm from. And uh, I, I I felt that I should remove myself from public ministry as much as possible uh, and sort of become a, a, a private person. So, so yeah, the, you know, I had said at one point in my blog uh, that I felt that I was, uh, I couldn't remain uh, a priest externally and a Muslim inwardly. And I, I said that to, I didn't want people to feel that I was being duplicitous or mm -hmm. that I was living a double life. Um, and I think some people picked up on that and felt that they, that's exactly what I was doing. But it's not really true. I, I felt that, you know, it's not that I had gone for years secretly practicing Islam and, mm -hmm. uh, and publicly being a priest. It all sort of happened um, over the course of the year, last year while I was in California. Uh, I lived up in the mountains, in a shack, basically. <laughs> and I was just reading books of, about his Not in a van down by the river, no, but in a no. shack up in the mountains, no. okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, as soon as I felt that, you know, that's where I was, spiritually and personally, I, I, I removed myself from public ministry. And that said, you know, coming back to Pittsburgh, there was a question, you know, it wasn't for me, you know, converting to Islam, it wasn't so much, you know, I had to tell a few people, my friends and family, I had to figure out how to tell, you know, everybody, because everybody wanted to know what I was doing, where I was going, um, what my plans were, and, uh, and we had even, I was even involved in a project in Texas to try to start a, a monastery. Um, so... Yeah, I never really figured out how to mm -hmm. tell everybody. Uh, so, in a fit of uh, being back here in Pittsburgh and just sort of living privately and praying as a Muslim and everything, I, I felt 
that I was happier than I'd ever been, actually. And uh, and I felt in, in that state of mind that I would just post the shot on Facebook. And I thought, you know, I don't know. Because it was really stressful for me to figure out, like, how do I tell everybody mm -hmm. this? And so I, in a fit of, uh, I don't know, inspiration, I guess, I had you know, pulled the trigger, so to speak. Yeah. And I thought maybe some people... Well, it was in Arabic. Also. Yeah, so I, thought maybe I remember seeing that post. Or, or thought, thought yeah. it was a joke or something. But they didn't think it was a joke. And they, uh, yeah, and a Catholic blogger friend of mine... Um, and they knew immediately what it was. Or yeah, was some people yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. that's, that's what surprised me. I, I remember yeah. checking my... Checking Facebook early one morning around mm -hmm. Fedra time and um, you know and I, and I saw them oh great you know this, this, <laughs> yeah. come out of the closet get ready now <laughs> yeah I mean I had to at some point yeah. or another yeah it was just you know I just had to at some point and you had already left the monastery at mm -hmm. that time and you were you know pretty well settled in Pittsburgh or yeah pretty much. settled to mm -hmm. a certain extent yeah yeah mm -hmm. So it weren't like it wasn't like you know, you were in the monastery walking back and forth, seeing you mm -hmm. know the other monks and uh, worshippers one day and then the next day. <laughs> yes, yeah. I also wanted some time to be private and to be quiet yeah. and to reflect on it before I did do anything publicly, and I didn't want to cause any scandal, so mm -hmm. I wanted to do it as mm -hmm. quietly as possible, which is why. You know, I thought, you know, if I was in the monastery, I could talk to the abbot, and he probably would be fine with it. And like I said, I still have a very good relationship with him. Mm -hmm. um, he's very supportive. Um, but it would have been awkward to be in the monastery and have that conversation, I, I think, for me, anyway. But, um, so I removed myself from there. I drove all the way from California back to Pittsburgh. That was a beautiful, beautiful drive. But, uh, yeah... So, but I wanted it to be as quiet as possible. Um, I said in a, in a former interview that if I if I could have just sort of faked my death and just went off on my way, I'd been fine. But but I didn't have that option. So, but but what happened was just uh, the exact opposite of what my intention was, and it just sort of blew up. And um, so, mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, yeah, subhanallah. So now. You mentioned not living a double life, mm -hmm. and so I guess, and you know, one of my questions was, um, when did you first decide that you are a Muslim in a priest's garb? Yeah. And um, you know, what did was there a specific moment that this this happened, or like, can you can you pinpoint yeah. like one time? You know, maybe in the middle of the afternoon, it's like, wow, I need to. There, this is who I really am and who I want to be, or was this just it was under the surface yeah. and just you know? It was a little bit of both, I think, mm -hmm. because when I, like I said, I was studying uh, at Marquette University mm -hmm. in Milwaukee and uh, living in the monastery for years. Um, I didn't have access to anything other than well, the internet and. Um, the monastery library, which is pretty specific and small. And then all of a sudden I had access to this entire uh, university library with a, a really great um, selection of books on Islam and Sufism and things like that. Uh, so that, you know, so it was during that time, and also I was reading the Quran regularly, along with you know, the Bible and scripture, Christian mm -hmm. scripture. And it was during that time that I felt, I had this feeling that, and I didn't really express this to a lot of people, um, I felt that I was in a way something something like a, uh, a Muslim and Christian. <laughs> okay. Because I felt that I saw, I, the more I read about the Islam, the more I read the Quran, I felt that at the very least there was truth in it. And then what do I do about that? You know, how does that affect me? And, uh, mm. and it wasn't until the last year that, you know, so it was always sort of under the surface and increasingly so over time. And it wasn't until the last year that uh, I just sort of, at some point I just came to the conclusion that everything that, 
in a certain sense, I wish to see in Christianity and everything that, um, I don't know, every, every, yeah, everything was sort of seemed to be fulfilled in Islam, basically, it was sort of built into Islam. Mm. So, uh, once I reached that conclusion, I, I didn't know what to do. I think that's when I reached out to you. Mm. And, uh, so there's a certain sense you can read, you know, you can read all these books on your own and everything and come to your own understanding and conclusion, but there's, there's something to be said for asking, you know, someone who's more, uh, who's, you know, more mm -hmm. authoritative, a asking like an actual person who, who's mm -hmm. authoritative in the faith and, uh, and yeah, so, so I, I started to reach out to, uh, Imam Chris and some others, um, at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, just things went from there. That's interesting how, um, and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. One thing about, um, now you mentioned the Bible and of course, and, and the Christianity felt like Islam fulfilled Christianity in some ways. Now, um, sometimes when talking about the Quran and the Bible or about Isa salam and the Prophet mm -hmm. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people, you know, with Within Islamic tradition, you know, as as we know that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, you know, do not prefer me over any of the other prophets, mm -hmm. and um, you know, however, sometimes when speaking to Christians, they might feel like as if it's as if it's a competition mm -hmm. between Jesus and Muhammad, mm -hmm. alaihi wasallam, or um, the Bible and the Quran. Do you feel like uh, when you look back on the Bible or whether it's different passages or entire sections like the Gospels and mm -hmm. uh, the letters of Paul um, you know do you feel like any um, that it's easy to harmonize between all that and what you've learned from Islam or do you mm -hmm. feel that there really is a conflict as even a lot of Muslims when I'm talking about um, when talking about the Bible or, or Quoting the Bible, sometimes they will, um, you know, we know that we have the Quran. Mm. Um, Alhamdulillah, and that is the definite, you know, authoritative, the, the be all, end all, so to speak. But as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, that you know, hadithu an bani Israel wa la you know, tell the stories of the children of Israel, and, and you know, there's no sin, there's no blame upon you. Do not confirm it. Do not deny it. And uh, so that you might not confirm something that's false or deny something that's true. Mm. And, um, you know, with that in mind, so I've, I've seen a lot of Muslims go and, you know, it seems that, you know, taking various extremes. Some will, um, you know, narrate anything and everything from the Bible and um, almost uh, use that as source material more than Islamic mm. texts, Islamic scriptures, while others would, you know, they have a knee-jerk reaction anytime you, you know, mention uh, even the smallest passage from the Bible, even if it um, is in 100% agreement with mm. the Quran. Now, um, but as far as the continuity between the Bible and specifically, I guess, some of those more finer points of uh, Christian theology to Islam and the Quran. Did you find that there was a more of a harmony or a stumbling block going from one to the other? Um, well, uh, one of the I'll just back up a little bit and say one of the original reasons I didn't uh, convert in 2003 was because I felt that in a certain sense that I would be, you know, quote unquote, rejecting Christ. You know? And um, growing up, being raised uh, sort of nominally Protestant. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, once, you know, once I understood Islam a lot better years down the line, I realized that that wasn't, you know, what I would be doing at all. Or at least, that's not the, you know, I think if you asked a Muslim, they, they would not say that they were rejecting Christ. And certainly the, the idea of the Trinity and Christ, you know, being divine, uh, 
that would be rejected. But but as far as you know, you know, the Bible and the Quran and continuity, I think you can uh, uh, error and go on both extremes. Um, on the one side, being completely uh, syncretous, right? and you know, saying that you know they're basically both the same and they're. And their teaching and whatnot. That's mm-hmm. that's not true. Uh, I think that I think there are differences, um, and sometimes really important differences. Uh, yeah, but also at the same time, to think that you know everything uh, from the Christian tradition is is just sort of scrapped. I, I guess, <laughs> mm-hmm. or just thrown thrown out, and um, or it is not not uh, useful or. Compatible is also not true. I don't think, especially if you look at uh, the varieties of um, the early understanding of early Christianity um, and who who Christ is, who Jesus is, and um, I think uh, Christianity uh, there's a lot more varieties of belief and understandings in the early years of Christianity until it all sort of became solidified under the uh, Nicene councils and uh, under uh, once Rome became uh, mm-hmm. Christian, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I felt that there was a lot of at least for me personally, I felt that there was a lot of continuity, and I, you know, I wasn't just throwing out everything and starting a new. Um, um, yeah, because. You know, it's the same Abrahamic spiritual lineage um, from the same, roughly the same part of the world, of the same. <laughs> yeah, it's it, there's there's just a lot of uh, similarities. Yeah, this, this the uniting spirit of it all is definitely preserved and mm-hmm. amplified and brought back to center focus with this. Yeah, line. and uh, um, with Tim Winter, right? It's, mm-hmm. uh, he said something. In Cambridge, mm-hmm. um, which I also um, talked about on my blog or referenced, where I said you know, <clears throat> there's this idea that if you convert to Islam, you're just throwing you're just starting totally fresh and you're throwing away everything of your own cultural heritage. Um, and if you're a Christian in the West, that would be true if you became like a Tibetan Buddhist, which a lot of people do. <laughs> You know, and uh, but somehow that's more uh, mm-hmm. that's uh, that's more socially acceptable, I think. To, to like, if you're a Christian or a, or a Jew or whatever, and become Buddhist, that's sort of fine. But becoming Muslim, yeah, because Buddhists are yeah. understood to be apolitical. Apolitical, <laughs> it's kind of fits in with the new agey kind of uh-huh. you know spiritual, not religious. Or mm-hmm. Islam is it's it's just. It's just uh, exotic enough, I guess, to be outside of the culture and, and just close enough to be a threat, I think. Yeah, and, and, so, and there aren't any, are there any drone strikes in Nepal? I don't know. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. There are fighting Buddhists, so, you know, so, but anyway. Who are they fighting against, so? though? Well, well, anyway, anyway so I'll talk about um, World War II we'll atrocities. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> We don't want to get too too <laughs> yeah. deep off track here. <laughs> so, but that said, having said that, also, I think uh, even though I've been reading uh, Islam for over twenty years, actually entering into the, the faith, I realized that there's just so much, especially not knowing Arabic to learn Arabic, but there's so much that I just in the tradition that is so completely. Um, new to me or that I don't know that it, it uh I wouldn't say it's a learning curve but it's uh I don't know it's just a very broad and deep tradition in Islam mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. so uh, yeah coming into Islam even with my background in the monastery and you know my studies in theology um I think it's still helpful but it is kind of like diving into a whole different world <laughs> yeah. in a sense yeah even if there's you know similarities in continuity yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah definitely yeah and one one thing I like what you said about um, you know 
contemplation and having time to yourself to um, to think and ponder about things. And um, you know, really, when when it comes to our spiritual lives and um, you know, ultimately deciding what's best for us, this is something that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala even evokes in the Quran. Say, tell them, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I only exhort you and admonish you to one thing and to qumu lillahi mathna wa furada thumma tatafakkaru to stand up for Allah in pairs or and singly you know by yourself and then to ponder reflect think deeply ma bi sahibikum min jinna there is no insanity with your companion and compatriot of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in huwa illa nadhiru lakum min bayn yaday adab min shadeed he is only a warning to you before an intense tremendous punishment and so pondering and that's one of the things that um, you know the Quran exhorts us to all the time you know afala ta'qidun you know don't you rationalize and, and reflect to tafakkarun and give thought and um you know, you remind me a little bit of my own story when I am um, about for a year before I took shahada myself or about for maybe about uh, two years or so, I spent a lot of time just I felt this urge to pace around. I, I started pacing around in my home and uh, my parents said, you know, you're, you're driving us nuts. Go go outside and pace around in the yard or in this. We have this huge we, we have this huge field uh, parking lot uh, near our home and so I would spend hours at a time just walking around there and just uh, you know thinking and um, you know I think that time that you can spend pondering the creation and mm -hmm. you know being closer to nature outside of the four walls and, and roof and, and, mm -hmm. and man-made objects that we're surrounded by all the time and technology and get closer to uh, the ground into the sky then you know alhamdulillah does great wonders for our faith and, and bringing us closer to Allah now um, going back you know, and, and springing from that thought right now and how the monastery that kind of existence helped you in in that way now there are when we um, one of the things about the priestly life and um, the monastic life that we think about is, for example, the vow of celibacy, the vow of poverty that, um, you know, Catholic priests and monks have to take. And, um, you know, a lot of um, religious folks from many different traditions inside and maybe outside of Christianity, too. I'm not, not really certain about all that. But, um, you know, how much of that life and those... Uh, parts of it do you plan on taking with you or have you or do you think that it was something that I mean how do you how do you look back on on um, on that and actually if you, if you don't mind this is because this is something that you know is is a world that you know will never really be privy to mm -hmm. Was there an actual formal vow? Did you yeah. say some words in front of a, a company of uh, hosts, I imagine? In front of God. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Uh, which I took very seriously, actually. Yeah, um, yeah I, well, I, I mean, even in the Quran, it says that there's a, there's a Quran, or is it, there are priests and monks in it, and the Christian, you think, probably quote it better than me. Yeah, that are closer cool. to God. Um, so I think, I think I, I know uh, a number of Orthodox um, people, Eastern Orthodox or Eastern Christian, Byzantine Catholic is very similar spiritually mm -hmm. liturgical, um, who have uh, converted to Islam, and I think there's because I think that they see a continuity in tradition in a certain sense. Uh, and in Eastern Catholicism and in Eastern Orthodoxy, there's a there's a there's a, a, a large emphasis on preserving the tradition uh, in all its facets, and one of them is monasticism. And there's a sense, especially in the West, I think. Mm -hmm. By the West, I mean you know, Western Europe and America. Um, 
that to go off to a monastery is to um, totally remove yourself from society and behind closed doors in a very uh, sheltered um, existence. And sometimes you'll have that in certain uh, Cistercian and Benedictine traditions. It's very cloistered, and all you do essentially is you work, but you to support yourself in the monastery. Um, but your main vocation is to pray daily, and you pray the offices all throughout the day. And um, so, so the the idea, of, which is what we did, we pray. You wake up very early, and you pray matins, and you pray lauds, and you pray the small hours throughout the day. And so the whole day was interspersed with prayer. Um, and matins and lauds. Lauds are prayers. Yeah. Yeah. So matins mm-hmm. was. Would be in the morning, like before oh, okay, the sun okay. came up. Lauds was when, when the sun came up. The praises, yeah. Okay. And then you do like there's smaller hours, and then vespers at night. And so this idea of uh, interspersing your day with prayer, it's it's there, and it's I mean it's here in Islam, and mm-hmm. and in a certain sense, I feel that uh, you know monastic life. You know, we have in the Christian tradition the Desert Fathers. Uh, when Christianity, when the Roman Empire became officially Christian, uh, before that, to give yourself to give yourself most completely to you know Christ or to God, you would go and be martyred. You would uh, you'd be martyred in the arena. Um, but once that was that the uh, was that Ignatius the one who was uh, Ign- yes okay yeah it was one of, and they cut yeah. open his heart and they had the name. Jesus on the throne, but uh, yeah, uh, um, but once um, the um, Roman Empire became Christian, there was no longer that aspect of radically giving your life. So, so people would go out into the deserts and droves and live in the deserts, and that's where monasticism started um, to live a more uh, extreme life and you know totally dedicated to the tree. Um, and so, and yeah, the, uh, and and so a lot of those. Fathers and mothers that we go into the desert are called the desert fathers, and they have a very sort of desert spirituality. It's very, um, it's very simple. There's a lot of sayings and aphorisms and everything. And I, I feel that you know, and other people have confirmed this uh, that have been Orthodox and Eastern Christian who've become since become Muslim that uh, it, there's a very uh, strong desert fathers feel. I think in Islam, uh, the type of spirituality. Um, and this type of uh, monastic spirituality, but rather it's sort of shared with the whole community, with everybody. It's sort of global, basically. So, so instead of just the monks praying, you know, five or seven times a day, everybody's praying for five or seven times mm-hmm. a day. Mm-hmm. And instead of uh, you know going out to the desert to like give alms and to fast, you know, everybody's giving alms and fasting. You know? So I. Even in monastic life, and in Eastern and Eastern Christian monastic life, you don't have that strong sense of um, being cloistered. People would come to the monastery all the time, and we would go out into the world, so to speak. It was very there was a lot of interaction between uh, the community and the outside world. So, so even within monasticism, I feel there's a lot of continuity um, moving into Islam, uh, but it's on. But that sort of monastic mindset, in a certain sense, is on um, just sort of a larger scale, uh, and in the world, so to speak. So you know, mm-hmm. you still you still work, you still have a family, you know, and you still have these responsibilities, um, but you still do all these things: fasting and prayers and daily, and, um, dying to yourself. You know, this sort of those, those things that were very. Uh, very much part of our monastic spirituality. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I know there are going to be some folks that are curious mm-hmm. regarding the vow of celibacy. Is mm-hmm. marriage on or off the table for you? What <laughs> are you not going to say? Uh, uh, well, some folks want to know. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I, I took. Uh, well, I went to the monastery in 2009, and even before then, I was sort of preparing myself you know, for a few years or so. 
in the monastery. And so in the monastery, you, know, you take a vow of poverty and celibacy and stability. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, you know, it's, I, I feel that's something that, I don't know, with everything going on right now, is something I'm sort of keeping on the back burner, I guess, in my head. Because, uh, you know, in a certain sense, I've gotten used to being, you know, mon monk means, comes from the Greek word monikos, which means, like, being alone, in a sense of being alone with God. Mm -hmm. So, living that life, you, I don't know, I guess you, you sort of get used to that... Um, aspect of, um, I don't want to say single, but, yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't want to say bachelorhood, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a type of, uh, it's a type yeah. of seclusion and independence, uh -huh. I guess. Uh -huh. So, so independence. I don't know. That's yeah. that's that's definitely. Uh, <laughs> so, you don't don't want anyone yeah, bossing you around. I've been asked about that, so I'm sort of. Yeah. I've, I've been I don't know. I've been a um, sort of agnostic on the question. I guess as far as fair enough. Uh, fair we'll see how it goes. And, and I think that's wise. It really. Um, I guess if you open yourself up too much, you mm -hmm. um, you know that might be. A way for Shaitan to uh, get to you and tempt you one way or the other, or um, you know, distract you a lot, and um, you know, especially I mean, for uh, for all the single Muslims out there, you know, whether especially for those that are not thinking about marriage, or you know, have zero thought or contemplation about mm -hmm. marriage. I mean, I would never write it off completely, mm -hmm. but. Um, but always be open and pray and ask Allah for what's best and to make it uh, uh, apparent to you that, we'll that that is what is best for you, inshallah. Yeah, I mean, because initially, because it's only been about, oh wow, gosh, when did, end of February, it's end of May. It's been it's only been about three months since everything was made public and um, immediately all these rumors, uh, you know, started floating around the internet. I was married to a Turkish woman, and I ran away to Turkey. And, and she has a name. There's a whole thing like on, online. It was like, oh, what's wow. her name, and how much is she worth? De debunking like, your story and like, no, here's, here's the real yeah. Father Hilarion. Really I, I saw him in in a Turkish pub, and he you know, yeah. with his wife or something like that. Uh -huh. Or yeah. I was trying to start a cult or all sorts of stuff. Oh, um, yeah. so. Yeah, so since, I, I mean, I can't stress enough the fact that, you know, since in the past six months, you know, I think every single aspect of my life has changed completely. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. my relationship with my family, uh, my spiritual life, just moving, um, finances, um, yeah, just everything is completely different now, so I think, uh, sort of taking one thing at a time, I guess, right now, for the mm -hmm. time being. Yeah. Now, that's a, an interesting thing. Now, um, now, you mentioned family, mm -hmm. and one thing that um, whenever anyone takes Shahada here at the mm -hmm. ICP, I always mention to them that, you know, you have to um, be ready for tests from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, upon your conversion and, and afterwards, and those tests could come in, in different forms. It could be, um, you know, enticements and, uh, and prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, did you experience, you, you mentioned some uh, different kinds of enticements as you were trying to leave the, uh, oh, yeah. the church. Tell me about that. Well, oh, us about that. yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. Um, well, once I decided to, take this route and come back to Pittsburgh. It was a matter of just um, practicalities as how I would leave and when, uh, coming back to Pittsburgh from California. And uh, yeah, it was, um, you know, before I, before I left uh, decisively from the monastery, I was offered, I mean, nobody knew what I was thinking, but I was offered all sorts of Things, uh, you know, I was offered a, 
you know, a parish in in Hawaii or a parish in Alaska, which actually I always wanted to go to Alaska more than Hawaii, probably. Um, we had been trying to start a monastery in Texas, uh, and that that whole that that's also a whole other story, but no. um, and we had difficulty with. Uh, the land and with bishops and all sorts of things and um, and uh, and all, you know nothing was working out after years and uh, all of a sudden I was offered uh, you know, something like uh, 40 acres of mountaintop land outside of Ashland Asheville Ashland Kentucky or North Carolina rather um, Asheville, Asheville North, North Carolina, Carolina. Uh, just a beautiful property and so so I think everything that I've been working for for a long time all of a sudden just happened to fall right into my lap and it, yeah but at that point I thought you know if I just I you know I could go the easy route and sort of take it and live comfortably I guess you know but at that point I thought that I would be being duplicitous and you know, my inner life is not matching my external True. life anymore. True. Um, and I, you know, I really do think that there's a lot of, uh, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I think there's a lot of men in the church, I think, who've been priests all their lives, uh, who that's what they do when they don't have a, a really backup plan or anything. And, and, and sometimes they might have this uh, inner conversion or even lose you know, their faith at some point along the way. Uh, but yet they stay in that position because you know, it's comfortable. And <laughs> mm -hmm. what else are they going to do? So yeah. that's just my personal belief. But, uh, um, but yeah, so. But then there, then after I came back to Pittsburgh, you know, everything was very peaceful until um, the news became public. And then it was a whole other uh, set of issues um, I think, uh, yeah, overnight, um, it just, the story spread like wildfire just, uh, and globally. And yeah, I don't know. In fact, I'm thinking like that, that whole metaphor of spreading like wildfire just yeah. doesn't cut anymore. Spreading like the internet, I Maybe. guess. Would be. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, all of a sudden I went from sort of obscurity to, well, I was, uh, the top one of the top Christian priests in the world, apparently, who had converted to Islam, and I don't know. Uh, yeah, it was it was a really interesting time. Um, but yeah, and I was watching this with horror because I hadn't told my family anything yet, and um, eventually they found out, and they weren't very uh, they weren't very happy about it. I think, uh, and, I, and I think a lot of it is just simply. Uh, a misunderstanding of Islam and what Islam is. And I think if your understanding of Islam is primarily from uh, 2003 Fox News, um, you're not gonna, <laughs> you're, you know, it's, I, I think most Americans, that's what they think about Islam basically is, you know, terrorism, ISIS, that kind of stuff. Um, which is unfortunate because, I mean, there's such a depth of tradition and there's such a broad tradition also, I think, in a certain sense, um, to accept a, a sort of a gross uh, caricature of Islam is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that, yeah, I think that can be remedied just by uh, more exposure to Islam and Muslims and uh, in a, in a proper and healthy way, I feel. Yeah, now you mentioned your family here, so um, now we, um, with the with the ICP here and in Pittsburgh, every month, um, you know, we try to at least on every month have a uh, get-together, a luncheon or potluck for the uh, the Muslim converts of the masjid. Um, sometimes it's a potluck, sometimes, you know, we'll um, go out to lunch together and um, during Ramadan we had an iftar together. Now, uh, before Ramadan, um, I think our last meeting before Ramadan was at um, uh, your uh, your employer's place, uh, the Pizza Kitchen, and mm -hmm. um, you know, crashed there. And um, our theme was for for that meet to um, to talk about 
you know, the relationship between converts and parents. And you, know, you shared with us at that time, if I remember correctly, that your parents were still in the dark mm -hmm. about um, your, your status. So how's that uh, story uh, come about? Now you mentioned not taking it favorably and uh, mm -hmm. meeting and um, maybe the, uh, under the influence of Fox News. And uh, that's something that I do hear quite often. Mm -hmm. Uh, for um, converts and um, you know, and people considering Islam, so you know they might want to know what exactly, what were the different events that took place there for your parents to find out, and um, mm. I guess yeah. Well, my family basically found out through social media. Um, I had sort of, I had sort of been waiting until after Easter to say anything, so. but. That didn't work out either. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and initially it was a shock, uh, and I think there was a lot of um, misunderstanding. Uh, again, the same thing. You know, you're rejecting, you're rejecting Christ, and you're rejecting your salvation, and, and things like that, and, and uh, even the you know the priesthood and everything. Um, there was a sense that I was sort of throwing it away. Um, uh, you know, for most people in my family, I think, and it's still also very new and fresh for them, uh, the more I talked to them, uh, the more they sort of understood my position, even if they dis might disagree with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they at least uh, have a better understanding rather than, uh, you know, conjectures and um, assumptions and you know, reading things secondhand. Uh, online, I guess. Um, so I, th I think a, a, a good, healthy communication is the the best in that situation. Yeah, yeah. and also a non a non combative one. I think that's not helpful. You know, it, it, if yeah, tensions become heated or there's misunderstanding, to argue, I think is. Um, counterproductive um, because then then people sort of get which is which is uh, why we're in the position I think we're in partly with the social media and just our so, um, just our public discourse I think um, you know people become polarized and then they lock they lock uh, you know they retreat into their their corners and you know but but a, a very helpful uh, loving calm rational <laughs> Dialogue as much as possible, I think, is I think is uh, very helpful. Also, mm -hmm. and even listening to, I think a lot of people, like in my family, uh, the initial responses were came from a place of you know, like pain or fear or things like that, and, and uh, to understand that you know that emotional response under underlying it and responding accordingly. Um, I think is also helpful for me, at least, in how you know, I approached the issue of mm -hmm. my family. So, and not just my family, but you know, close friends who were surprised or shocked um, to hear about my conversion. Although most people that really know me weren't surprised at all. So, <laughs> okay, and, okay. You know, it depends. Yeah, it's so interesting. The family, um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Family, the family response was the most difficult, I think. Your immediate family, your parents? I think so. Do you have brothers or sisters? I have a younger brother. Okay. He was, you know, we're very opposite. And we had not much in common. It's so typical we, among siblings. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so. Mm. Yeah, because, I mean, cause you can, you know, friends and people online can come and go, whatever, but your family is your family. And, and you have to, I mean, it's just a sin to cut off your family and not have anything to do with them, which some people in my family right now are, are sort of at that position, but right, well, right now, well, this, like it is yeah, it's just sort of temporary, uh, yeah. uh, God willing. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. Inshallah. Yeah, that's, um, now, now for you as, um, to say, put it plainly, for male converts, I've found it very rare that they get cut off by their mm -hmm. family. 
Um, but of course, your position as a former priest, that's, that's a bit different, especially if your family took a lot of pride in, um, in your former position, mm -hmm. then, you know, it might be, um, I mean, obviously it's going to be a tender, tender spot, and not, you know, coming from a, um, you know, fairly uh, religious family. Mm -hmm. For, for a lot of women though, it's I found that it's more likely for them to experience that, um, you know, cutting off or disowning from their family members. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes what I, what I hear most common is that the family might say, you know, just don't be in a hijab in public mm -hmm. in my presence and stuff. And, you know, along with sudden, so that's something that I do also hear quite often. And, um, you know, I've also heard, you know, sometimes even from um, the families of Muslim men, don't be in a thobe around me in mm -hmm. public. And so there's, you know, while there is a general tolerance of your presence, mm -hmm. despite your religion, there's also not wanting to be public and, and mm -hmm. present at the same time mm -hmm. with family. And, and now here's, you know, half the family is on a different religion. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned family being religious and, and I, it's been my experience anyway, and other people have said the same also. It seems to be the most religious, and I think gen the most genuinely religious Christians that I know are very understanding. Even, again, even if they might disagree, they, they, I think they have, sometimes they have the spiritual understanding and the spiritual, I don't know, maturity, I think, to, to, to be understanding. The most vitriolic most vitriolic reactions I've gotten were from more uh, secular people, even Christian. secular Christians. I think mm -hmm. Christianity is sort of a, a political identity or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, them and uh, no hardcore Thomists actually. <laughs> First of all, when you say secular Christians, uh -huh. which is are you referring to like more on the liberal political spectrum or the conservative or, or just all over the map? I guess I Probably more it. on the conservative side, okay. uh, where Christianity is is, is sort of a, it's not so much a living faith, more of um, identity. You mm -hmm. know, as we're we're Western, we're you know, so we're, we're Christian. But it, it probably would be said. I don't, I don't know. There's there such a thing as secular Christians on the left anymore. Uh, perhaps I think they. I think that's just what our culture is basically now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> American um, culture. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, it's it's become, and a lot of people have commented on this, like Tom Holland and some others. As our current American culture, uh, as far as like you know, left, left and woke ideology and whatnot, mm -hmm. it's basically uh, American. It's basically Christian. Christianity stripped of its transcendence, I guess. Mm, so, okay. That's a whole other yeah, discussion. Yeah, it's, so it's the answer. There's a lot to unpack there, I'm sure. <laughs> there definitely is. Yeah. So, but I think, yeah, I think that's that sort of mindset. Well, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's another interview, I guess. <laughs> now, you've only, um, now it's it hasn't even been a year since you formally or formally, formally took shahada mm -hmm. um, in the presence of other Muslims. But, of course, a lot has happened in that time, mm -hmm. especially in the last five, six months. What has been the biggest surprise for you, apart from things going viral? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure that's number one, but... Um, you know, maybe in terms of whether it's the responses that you've gotten or community or just personal reflections or how your life has changed mm -hmm. or stayed the same in different ways. What would you say is um, maybe anything <coughs> that happened that you did not expect? Yeah. Biggest surprises are probably two things. I think uh, the variety of um, responses that I've gotten from people. I think 
some of the people I felt were, would be the most understanding or, or not. <laughs> mm. And then some of the people I, I was most concerned about their, what they would think, they were very accepting and understanding. And it was hard to, is it really, there was really no determining factors how someone would respond. It was really, um, you know, each individual responded in their own particular way. There's that, and I think also just the, the hospitality and the kindness that I've experienced since I've uh, come to Islam. And something that I've never really experienced before, I think. Um, and I've just been uh, really uh, surprised at that. And um, yeah, there's, yeah, the, since coming back to Pittsburgh, um, yeah, everyone's just been really wonderful, especially at the Islamic Center here. Uh, uh, so I, yeah, I've been, I've been really blown away by just the hospitality and the mm -hmm. love that I've ex experienced for people. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's um, yeah, a good point to add. With with that, I'll actually um, mention. I mean, with the with the Islamic Center, this this was the the very first mosque that you ever actually went to mm -hmm. and, and visited. November of two thousand one. Okay, okay, just right after nine eleven. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I I myself I took shahada in um, on October 26, 2001 at the ICP in Peoria, mm -hmm. Islamic Center in Peoria. Yeah. And um, yeah, later on I received a huge amount of help from them when I started seeking knowledge and studying the deen in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, Alhamdulillah, and that's what has enabled me, myself, to, you know, ultimately first, you know, very instrumental in getting married and then um, you know, um, of course, doing a lot of other things and where I am today. Um, so how, uh, I mean, not to, not to make a plug mm -hmm. for um, the Islamic Center of Pittsburgh specifically, um, of course, that might be, um, you know, you can't, uh, uh, I can't deny the uh, some, some desire there, but, um, you know, how, in, in what ways specifically, I mean, what, I guess, um, Practically speaking, how has maybe the ICP or the Muslim community been uh, helpful in different ways? Well, I guess more um, because, and one of the reasons why, or one of the main reasons why I'm mentioning this is because I believe that you're not alone, mm -hmm. and that there are other other that there are other folks in your shoes mm -hmm. with a very similar story that are wondering the same thing. Mm -hmm. How might, you know, what if I do decide to mm. come out? What if I want to um, become Muslim? Or, and, you know, instead of going to the church every Sunday to give my sermon and, and give communion to people, mm. instead I drive one further block and go to the local mosque instead and just take part in prayers there five times a day yeah. you know what do you think and and also for mosques around the country that might be listening to this or members of those massages that are wondering you know how is it that we could help someone if there are existing people like that you know what might they need the most uh mm -hmm. to um uh, you know, give them the courage and, and assistance to to get underway. Yeah. Well, in my particular my particular situation, uh, I was living in a monastery for most of the past uh, decade and a half, I suppose. Um, and in a monastery, along with the vow of poverty, well, you have the vow of poverty, so you don't have mm -hmm. you don't have any money, you don't have any property. Uh, I barely had any, you know, secular clothes or anything. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a question for me, living in California, how would I get back across the country and what would I do? Like, I was essentially homeless, you know. Mm -hmm. I had a vehicle, but um, 
uh, if it was if it was only you know if it weren't for um, the help that I received at the ICP here at the Islamic Center mm -hmm. and then the Muslim community in general uh, we wouldn't be having this interview because <laughs> I wouldn't there I wouldn't have been able to do anything that I've done so it's just you know just basic things like uh, you know I came back to Pittsburgh and you know with like you know basically having no money at all you know help with zakat um, uh, funds you know and uh, there were people in the community that got me a job um, and then that were able to um, find an apartment for me. Um, just you know, financial assistance, mm -hmm. and that's only you know, it's it's it's, yeah. it's it's sort of just to get me on my feet. Yeah, and then, from the grace of Allah. I'm yeah, ex thinking. exactly. And then you know, going out to you know pursue my studies uh, in Islamic studies and Arabic generally. Uh, I've, all, mm -hmm. I've had help uh, in all those areas. So so I think a, a lot of people who are looking at uh, a conversion to Islam. Uh, there are a lot of um, practical considerations for a lot of them. Either they have families or they have careers or things that, you know, their whole life will change. So I think just having that uh, absolutely, you know, the spiritual and you know, brotherly support is very important. But even, you know, just sort of the practical support uh, is, is, is essential for, for a lot of people. I think that they're you know, converting to Islam will probably uproot a lot of areas, if not every area in their life. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it, you know, in a good way. But, but yeah. so I'm very thankful uh, for, for all that help. And uh, because I, if it were just like me doing it on my own, uh, uh, it would have been impossible. Mm -hmm. so. um, yeah, alhamdulillah, bro. I mean, it's. Um, yeah, it's a great blessing, and uh, you know, one thing about the the Muslim communities in, in general is that there are a lot of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and uh, whether they have businesses and are ready to employ people, or if they have property and are ready to house people, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, and, and when they when they have the ability to come together, you know, in, uh, in good circumstances, alhamdulillah, when Allah wants to make a way for someone, then then that way will be paid, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So, now, um, you mentioned um, your future studies in, uh, in Arabic, um, now, and uh, studying Islam. Where do you see yourself in, you know, five or ten years? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah, inshallah, we'll find out. But uh, uh, right now, um, yeah, the, there was a, a discussion I had with uh, some some other Muslims online, Mahdi Locke and some others, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a sense by some people that you know my authority as a priest in the you know the, the church transfers into a type of authority into Islam, which is not true. <laughs> I feel like there's, um, you know, coming into Islam, there's so much I have to learn and there's, you know, I have to learn Arabic and so much I want to learn. And so I'm, for the time being now, I'm pursuing my education further. Um, I go to a two year program, uh, mostly to study Arabic and then, um, inshallah, probably uh, go overseas to continue my studies and then wherever that takes me we'll see and I could uh, um, continue academically even um, get my PhD I don't know but um, everything's really really new and really fresh right now I'm sort of mm. seeing how things go uh, ultimately I'd like to be on a goat farm <laughs> <laughs> goat farm <laughs> I'm trying to help you out there because like, I'd like to I like the I'd like farm to see a good uh, goat farm nearby yeah, I, I like studying, I like academics, but, you know, anyway, but, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. I, I like that, yeah, well, exactly, yeah, I, I think, I think there's something to be said for, well, I, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about um, setting up sort of intentional communities and, you know, whether in the country or 
you know, other like-minded people in school. I think uh, supporting something like that would be very, mm-hmm. very nice. But, but yeah, we'll see. Everything's just so, like I said, everything in my own life has changed dramatically recently. And I'm just seeing how things things go, taking things a day at a time. But, uh, but definitely continuing my studies and um, learning more about uh, the faith. And, uh, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Some of the some of the Salaf alayhim, they said that you know to seek knowledge for if I remember correctly to seek knowledge for twenty or thirty years and then to teach you know make it in your intention to teach for twenty or thirty years and then after that to spend your time in, in worship for twenty or thirty years yeah. and if you you know pass away any time before the completion you'll still get the reward for all of it because of the yeah. attention and show all the time yeah. well, I mean, and, and of course you know one, one thing I, I picked up on your story is that the fact that you had this vow of poverty mm-hmm. that's actually one thing that well was a challenge to come to Islam without a job mm-hmm. of course but subhanAllah I've, I have met other ministers that it is family that's you know holding them back more than anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, um, wonder yeah. what I might yeah. say about that or then. Oh, although you, you well, that's, probably not your area of expertise. Yeah. Well, I've seen this before generally yeah. where there is a a family, a priest says a family who either wanted to become Orthodox or or you know I don't know many who wanted to convert to Islam. But, but definitely that's an issue because mm-hmm. for me, I felt that I was in a unique position to make that move, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, I really didn't have any um, uh, obligations or responsibilities other than you know, my vows and whatnot. But, but I, didn't, you know, I didn't have a family. I didn't have a, you know, a parish that I was responsible for. So I felt that I was in a unique place to make that move. Um, but yeah when it's just you um it, but yeah if you have children and you uh, have to raise in a family to feed and whatnot um, and you know roman catholic priests don't have that issue but certainly eastern catholic priests often do and orthodox priests mm-hmm. so yeah and that's where again the the um you know i guess I don't know, Rallying around someone to help them <laughs> if they have these sort of a, yeah. these uh, um, yeah. things to consider if they feel that you know they wish to convert to Islam and they can't because of these responsibilities. Yeah. Now I'm just reminded right now of um, I just remember Yusuf Pestas. Yes. You've heard his story, right? Mm-hmm. I think at the time that he converted, if I remember correctly. I think he was maybe selling musical instruments to churches or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And so his position was, I don't think he was actually making money as a, um, you know, the the senior pastor of a church at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, strategically speaking, if someone is in that kind of position, Especially if they have a family to support, mm-hmm. maybe going to a um, uh, a less direct uh, customer-facing position and, and yeah. something along the side. I've, I've heard of other. Um, uh, I think I've, I've I think I've almost met more former ministers than I've had actual ministers. Maybe mm-hmm. if they become, for example, a chaplain at a school or a prison mm-hmm. or such, making a conversion. Yeah. And in a, in a vocation such as that, where it doesn't really matter too much what the um, the religion of or, or denomination of the yeah. individual in that position, that might be a way yeah. of softening the blow, so to speak. Yeah, and actually, they could even continue in that position if they wanted to. I've seen priests do that before, mm-hmm. um, move outside of the diocesan structure or wherever, and... Yeah, get a, get a job as a hospital chaplain or something like that. And they feel they have more freedom to do you know, exactly what you said. Mm. Um, so that's that's very possible. Mm. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned your, your education and uh, continuing studies. Now, um, 
this question here, like in your interview with Paul Williams, mm -hmm. you mentioned about your search for um, true Islamic Sufism mm -hmm. and finding a lot of um, hippie stuff yeah. online whenever you look for, for, for Sufism and mm -hmm. what that actually meant. And you also mentioned discovering and, and trying to reconcile these Sufi Salafi debate mm -hmm. and rift within um, Sunni Islam yeah. because that's there, there's no doubt that that's the most palpable uh -huh. rift that exists you know yeah. in, in the in the Sunni Muslim world the Western Muslim world I mean there are there are lots of different divisions you know whether it's maybe between Medhab and things like this mm -hmm. that um, you know we can you know agree to disagree on things um, mm -hmm. you know whether it's you know wiping over socks or you know mm -hmm moon sightings and, and stuff like that but um, however within the Sunni Muslim world the Sufi Salafi uh, divide is is quite palpable mm -hmm. and um, sometimes it uh, divides communities yeah. and sometimes even divides families mm -hmm. um, so how did you how do you reconcile that and I'm not going to go into it too yeah. much here or, or go off on any, I, I, I'm going to try to avoid yeah. going off on tangents, but um, I might have to put my two cents in, but sure. yeah, go ahead. Well, I, did, I certainly can't speak authoritatively on mm -hmm. it really either, but I, and also I, mean, I don't feel I'm going to solve the issue <laughs> myself, mm -hmm. but uh, um, well, yeah, I think looking into Islam for, for years, um, I, I think what, what finally attracted me to Islam in 2003 was discovering Rumi and Sufism. And I read about this also in my sources mm -hmm. on uh, my blog. And this sort of spiritual aspects of uh, Islam. I feel the more I um, understood the history and the tradition of Islam that uh, that sort of dichotomy was never, well, it wasn't originally as pronounced as it is now, um, between sort of Salafism and Sufism. Um, and I think, I think also, again, if you take extremes on both sides, mm -hmm. um, that's problematic. Uh, but uh, I, yeah, I I felt you know part of my coming to Islam finally was sort of at least for me reconciling the differences that I saw and, and seeing that you know this, a certain understanding of uh, Orthodox Sufism was always sort of part of the you know the, you know, the, the mainstream Orthodox Muslim mm -hmm. tradition um, and now of course. If you, you know, when I was living in Milwaukee, um, I knew there was, there wasn't really terribly too much, um, as far as, uh, visible Islam in Milwaukee. There was an Islamic, uh, Islamic center, um, in the South side. Um, and even less was there of anything sort of, uh, Sufi. And when I say Sufi, I, I mean like traditional Orthodox mm -hmm. Sufism. Um, but which is what I was looking for. In two thousand three, you know, I, I discovering Rumi and Sufism, I felt attracted to that. And then when I look online in different places, I'd find all these sort of uh, groups that were very questionable and maybe didn't even have any connection to um, Islam generally. Who would call themselves Sufis? And it, you know, I just you know, to me, to be genuinely Sufi was to be genuinely orthodox Muslim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, and yeah, so for, for years I would try to find, um, I would just sort of Google Sufi groups in Milwaukee and other places and just get kind of a uh, very new age sort of hippie sort of things. And, and, and if, you're, if you're, if that's what you mean by Sufism, I think that's, mm -hmm. it's correct to, reject it but uh yeah mm -hmm. um 
I don't know. Like I said, I to, but I think there's a room for both sides of the Sufi and Salafis in Islam. And, you know, most Salafis are you know, just very pious people. And uh, I remember there was a story I heard in, in Senegal, I think, you know, in West Africa. There was a group there of, uh, of Muslims they were practicing. Um, and and someone described them as uh, Sufis, and they said, "Well, what is that?" And I was like, "Well, you practice the you know, the spiritual truth about Islam." It's like, "Oh, I guess that, yeah, that's what we are." Mm-hmm. And then someone described them as Salafis, and they said, "Well, what is that?" And it's like, "Well, you go back to the you know the sources," and I was like, "Oh, that's what we do." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. they, they had no concept of the sort of the the, the divisions or the labels, I guess, uh, but they saw mm-hmm. themselves as being. But at the same time, being very deeply you know, uh, spiritual in, in the spiritual aspects of Islam, and also very deeply um, uh, traditional, and going back to the sources. Um, so I don't know. I like again, I can't really speak authoritatively, and I don't tend to. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. it's just part of my own understanding and my mm-hmm. own bridging that rift. In, mm-hmm. in my understanding, that mm-hmm. saw Islam in, in a more holistic way, I think. Kind of. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one thing when we talk about orthodoxy mm-hmm. that would traditionally be defined as essentially, you know, as, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, describes as, you know, following the jama'ah, the mm-hmm. mainstream body, mm-hmm. or the largest body, or, you know, as some narrations mention, as sawad al a'zam the greatest mass of um, the Muslims, the mainstream Muslim mm-hmm. group, alhamdulillah. And that's one thing about Islam that I love, you know, of, of so many different things that once you found Islam, you don't have to, you know, overturn every stone trying to find which is the same mm-hmm. sect or which is the proper denomination within Islam. You just follow the mainstream, you know, what is the, the, the orthodox body of, of Muslim scholars that has been continuing with the same tradition from generation to generation, mm-hmm. you know, alhamdulillah, and, um, you know, it's, um, it, you um, remind me of another quote from a, um, a, a Western scholar who said that, you know, if, if, if you're among Sufis, uh, let them think that you're a Salafi or a Wahhabi, and if mm-hmm. you're among Salafis, then let them think that you're a Sufi, and um, mm-hmm. you know, just to, I guess, not for the point of being a contrarian, mm-hmm. but that you know, you should always have that spiritual element, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and you know that is present within all of our scriptures and all of our traditions, and also be very firmly committed to orthodox and following the traditions, following and then making sure that you do have a precedent. A strong precedent for every one of your actions and vocations mm-hmm. and everything, you know, just to keep from falling <laughs> yeah. into heresy and shallow tongue. Yeah, certainly as a as a convert, uh, you don't want to uh, make things up as you go, or just you know rely on your own understanding based on your private reading, essentially. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's why a community and um, a religious guide also is is important. In my estimation. Absolutely. Just, what scholar was that? You remember? I I did not hear this quote directly. Okay. I heard it from someone who said they heard it from Hamza Yusuf. Uh, okay. Hamza Yusuf. It sounds like something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, inshallah, so this, this interview went on a lot longer okay. than I expected. So, we'll just conclude with one final question here. Is there anything else you want to add? <laughs> uh, Even if it's nothing, then we'll call it a day. But, I want to add. Well, yeah. I just well, I, well, I want to thank you first of all for inviting me here to to speak um, and again express my thanks to uh, the Islamic Center here, ICP, and then and, and more broadly to um, uh, everyone in the Muslim community who's really greeted me me with uh, open arms and uh and also the people in my former communities that uh have been supportive and you know, i don't know if they're watching or not but i just yeah just the sense of i, I feel uh, it was a great sense of gratitude for for everything that uh, 
uh, and all the help that I've been given and the love and support I've been shown. So I just, I just want to say thank you. And uh, yeah, and just please make, uh, if you're watching, make a duo for me. Um, it'll be an interesting next at least few years. I don't know. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. So, yeah, Inshallah. Well, Inshallah. bless you and, and all your endeavors and um, keep you on the straight path. And may Allah subhanahu wa bless all of us and guide us all the straight path. Subhanakallahum biyamdika shirwana ilaha illa antin as-salafirukwana tuwa ilayk. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.